Hello, my name is Dan Brown, and I'm here today again with another A Lens A Day Conversations About Information Architecture. And today I am excited to talk to the accomplished Imran Afsal. Imran, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me, Dan. I'm really, really excited to be here doing this session with you today. So we, uh, we've we exchanged some tweets uh, about IA, and uh, as I was explaining, I get super excited when anyone <laughs> tweets about <laughs> IA. Um, uh, perhaps too excited now that I'm reflecting <laughs> on it. But um, talk to me about sort of the role IA plays uh, in your uh, work. I'm I'm sort of curious. Uh, let's talk about process, but also sort of like given where you are uh, in your career, um, mm-hmm. what what has been your interaction with information architecture so far? So, if I kind of look at it from a broader perspective, uh, information architecture is really important to me when I studied UX and HCI and I saw it being this really important part of the process but when I left the academic environment and I went into working at agencies in-house I started to see that actually it was being almost left off the table there was there was a focus on design visual design there was a focus on um, kind of the engineering side a little bit of a focus on usability but information architecture was being forgotten you know I was working in companies where um, we didn't have content designers, we didn't have content writers, we didn't have information architects. It was very much kind of done as a part of other roles. And um, to to me, I felt the need to draw attention to it. So, So where I work at the moment, we didn't have a UX team. We had designers that could, you know, craft UX Um, materials and things like that but not a focused UX team so over a number of years I helped build a UX team and the prime focus of that UX team was to actually get into the details that other people were not you know kind of giving attention to so information architecture was was absolutely central to that Um, so that's kind of that's that's in the in the broader sense in terms of where I work at the moment we have a really complex business model so uh, we, we we have a series of uh, retail brands, online online retail brands, and they're not traditional retail brands. They work on a model where customers essentially um, get credit. Um, they get a credit account and they effectively buy something, and then they pay for that item or those items over a period of months, years, etc. So it's it's a real kind of interesting challenge for me because information architecture plays a really really key role in making sure that we. We, we get the content right, we, we get the information right, and we get the screens looking right. It's not just about making a nice retail site. Um, you know, we've, we've recently been looking at um, the kind of process that a customer or a user goes through in order to get a credit account. And that was just pure information architecture. Yes, we had visual design to do, but we spent so much time trying to define, you know, we had these series of screens and trying to define what we would show on each screen and what is relevant at this point in the journey in terms of information versus later on in the journey. So it's a really important part of what I do. And I'm just really keen to kind of get more people aware of it across the organization, across the community, because um, just to kind of throw this in, I was talking to a, a number of graduates over the past couple of weeks, and many of them, they're really focused on the visual design, but not on information architecture. And that that just worries me because I think if you can unlock the potential of information architecture in your team and yourself, I think you really can elevate your design beyond just, uh, uh, you know, kind of like a, a visual artifact that you create at the end of a process. Uh, Imran, that was, that was really great. Um, uh, talk to me a little bit about um, your go-to techniques for doing what you've just said, unlocking IA potential, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Like I'm, I'm picturing your team kind of working through the structure over time of yeah. um, uh, what did you call it? Sort of uh, dealing with, uh, with acquiring credit or, you know, yeah. the, the, that process yeah. as you're working through that to some extent, there's, there are some visual elements, as you said, but there's also yeah. some more abstract or conceptual elements as you're thinking through this process what is it what are some of the techniques that you use to kind of help facilitate those conversations or contribute to those conversations yeah absolutely so one of the things we do a lot of is actually collaborating with with 
each other in the team, but also bringing in, you know, POs, PMs to really sort of get wider perspective in there. That actually facilitates the conversation for us in a really, really good way. Because I think with information architecture, I was often kind of coming across people that felt uh, only UX designers or, you know, UX architects or whatever you want to call them, label them as, should be practicing information architecture. And in my experience, I think you need a wider pool of people in the conversation. So one of the one of the key things we always try and do is involve as many people in that process. So, for example, um, we did some work on navigation a little while back now, um, and it was really important that we didn't sit in a little room and just do the work on the navigation and then go and say, right, guys, we've got this brilliant idea for how we should do the navigation. Um, when it came to doing the card sorting exercise, which is always a, a good kind of, you know, go to kind of like starting point um, for navigation. It was about involving different perspectives. So, you know, we involved um, people from teams that were actually loading the data to the site. So, you know, really bringing their perspective in because they can really talk about how they kind of, you know, take data and turn it from one thing into another and how they receive data from, you know, suppliers of products and things like that so i would say that's that's our real kind of that's our key sort of ingredient in involving different people and what we find in that process is that we get different perspectives and it often makes us question you know what we're doing how we're doing it and how we can do it better and you know if we do something in the card sorting exercise for example and we find that we get some answers we can actually get another perspective where someone can come in and really, really kind of make us question something that we interpreted one way so that we can start going off and exploring it in a completely different way. So that is, that is for me, the, the key ingredient. Really. That's, that's great. Um, yeah. It's something that um, I have really come to appreciate uh, about um, design is that mm-hmm. it thrives on multiple perspectives. Like we have this maybe, um, almost mythological understanding of design where it's like, yeah. oh, there's some great genius came up with an idea, but in practice, it's lots and lots of people putting in their ideas. Yeah. It's lots of people sort of yeah. uh, contributing their perspectives, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And, you know, I always think that I, I've got my perspective, I've got my experience, my bias and everything, but each person's had a different upbringing. They've lived in a different culture. They've seen different things. They bring different mental models. You know, my mental model for navigation is completely different from another person. So the more people you involve and the more welcoming you make them feel. One of the key things that I've tried to do in my role is, is create that platform uh, for my team to collaborate with others, that openness. And that is quite hard to describe, but that abstract welcoming sort of feeling that you want to create for people where people think you know what if I come to your design review I will feel like I can say what I think and you know give you my genuine thoughts and not feel like I'm gonna have a bunch of designers sort of saying oh hold on you can't say that I spent two weeks working on that and I think to me that really facilitates the right conversations around information architecture because visuals is a little bit trickier I think when you create a visual it can often just be like I like red or I don't like red I you know, I, I think this is legible. I think it isn't. And you can do a lot of user testing, but information architecture, I think you need as many perspectives in there to kind of, you know, make that right progress with what you create. Do you have a a favorite, or let me start here. Uh, uh, when we're engaging stakeholders, Hmm. um, for better, for worse, one can't ask them directly what is your mental model, right? You you can't just ask someone what their mental model is. So we need to sort of tease it out uh, of them um, or tease out their perspective or tease out um, how they really understand the structures uh, that that we're putting in front of them. Do you have a favorite um, uh, or a heuristic uh, phrase or question or or approach for kind of uh, indirectly getting at someone's mental model? What what are some of the tools in your toolbox for doing that? That's a really interesting question. One thing that I often ask people to do is to try and forget where they work because I think that brings its own bias because if I'm talking to someone in the marketing department, they're often, they've got all those things in their head that they're supposed to be delivering on, you know, we need to get the conversion up, we need to get the 
you know, the average order value up and stuff. That I think then, I think that creates a bit of a conflict in what mental model they're bringing and possibly a combination of two mental models. And often I say to people, we're looking at this, we're trying to define where we go with this. Here's the problem. Here's the structure we have at the moment. I want to improve it. I want you to look at it from the point of view of you being, you know, a parent, a partner, a brother, a son or whatever, you know, someone at home just being a person trying to buy something or navigate, you know, through this particular structure. And I think that, to me, that sometimes works because, for example, we pre-COVID, we'd, we'd go into a room and we'd say, right, when we're in this room, we're not, we're not thinking about what we're trying to do for the business. We're trying to think like users. You know, we are all users. We have our own bias because, you know, not every user that shops with us will work for a, you know, a fashion retailer like I do. But actually getting people to think like a user and saying, think back to when you shopped online and then try and relate that into what you're looking at now, I think it helps people bring out their their real mental models and really question things in the right way. And it always pleases me when I hear people saying things like, well, for example, I was shopping the other day on this site and now I've just thought of this structure doesn't make sense because this to me feels different to what I saw. And then I think something is working well. Oh, that's great. Um, uh, and I think you're acknowledging this idea that um, uh, when people come to our sites or look at our products, they're really, it's really probably a multitude of mental models that are kind of is, interweaving. Yeah. Um, and uh, part of our job is to really just try and understand all the different inputs uh, into the, to the mental model. Because at the end of the day, even though we're designing these structures and being very, very deliberate about them, uh, when a user comes, they're just it's in the first, you know, five seconds or even millis yeah. five milliseconds mm -hmm. that they're trying to understand the things that they're they're looking at. Mm -hmm. um, so we put all of this work in and it's really just in that first split second that they're really trying to glean uh, mm -hmm. and align what they're seeing with what their ex expectation is, yeah. which I think brings us to yeah. our lens, uh, the lens that you picked out. Do you mind sharing what lens that was and maybe describe it in your own words? Yeah, so the, the lens I picked is uh, scannability. And I think, to me, this is a really, really important lens. Uh, scannability, for me, defines um, how easy or difficult you make a given interface um, in terms of someone coming to that interface and being able to quickly understand what's required. Um, and how they can go about completing their task. And I think the interesting thing with scannability for me is, um, I think things have changed in society. We no longer sit and read pages or interfaces. We consume content by scanning it. You know, we're, we've got such a busy lifestyle. You know, we've got so many devices that are pinging us. You know, um, you can be sat on in the living room couch and you've got the TV, you've got the iPad, you've got a phone, your partner showing you something on, on her phone, for example. So, you know, we're limited on time, we're limited on attention. So we actually consume content through just scanning things, glancing at them. And I think scannability is that measure of, you know, how easy or difficult have you made it for someone to be able to glance at something and quickly understand what's going on on screen. So talk to me a little bit about how you might make use of this notion of, you know, the kind of the, the fact that our users have such short attention spans. I think what you're saying is even in the context of when they're sitting down to do a task, um, like, you know, they want to buy something from one of the products that you're working on, um, we can't even count on them sort of being entirely focused on that, on that task. How does that factor into some of the design work that you've been doing? I think one thing it factors in um, quite a lot for is um, before we get to design, um, which is why I think information architecture is so important to be in the, in the conversation, is whether you're redesigning the checkout login screen, whether you're rethinking the navigation and the taxonomy for a given site, brand, to me, it always comes back to really looking at all of the content that we're going to include in that given interface or process or journey and really assessing whether it's absolutely necessary. In my experience, we always start with too much content because someone often sits down to come up with content for a given process or interface and they feel it's their job, their responsibility to formulate all of this great content. And it usually is great content, but actually it's about getting to that 
minimum amount that the user needs in order to complete their task. We don't just want to give them lots of great content. We want to give them the right content that hopefully is great for what they're trying to do. Um, so I think it's, you know, it's such an important thing to do at the start of any given project process, anything that, you know, we work on in my team, we just go, go to assess and question things, not in a pessimistic way, not in a negative way, but to really, you know, work with the teams and say, look, we've got all this content. Do we really need it? Because actually, if we put it on a page, this is, you know, this is how much content someone will have to consume and they'll, they'll have to find the relevant bits out of that content that will help them. And we're just, you know, just making life hard for them. And I think when you have that conversation, it starts to get people on board. And sometimes you have to create prototypes to, you know, kind of like prove a point with content in order to fight, fight to kind of like, you know, get that content right and really get it concise. Um, so it feels right. So I think that, that to me is so important to do. Yeah. And it, it kind of goes back to what you were saying about, you know, they have to kind of switch their hat um, mm. because if you know what the content is, right. Mm. No matter how uh, like how much you try and sort of separate yourself from yeah. it, if you know what it is, you have a different relationship to that content than mm. someone who's showing up for yeah. the first time. And, you know, that reminds me of a, a great example. I, I worked with um, uh, our DPO, a data protection officer, and this was a few years back. We were about to implement cookie consent. It became like the legal requirement in the EU that you've got to have cookie consent on. So we we kind of, we had all this content and I remember having all these discussions saying, you know, this this is too much for the, you know, for the user to consume. We, we need to really cut this down. We need to, most people don't know what cookies are. They probably don't care but some will care. So we just need to get that balance right. And it wasn't until the, the DPO sat with end users and saw users trying to understand the content that he sort of came to me and said, right, I get what you mean now. We do need to cut this down. So I think sometimes you got to take yourself out of that equation and really put the person creating the content with the people using and consuming the content. Yeah. Um... I'm glad you went. I'm, I'm glad you brought that example up because we had been talking about scannability, sort of in the in the context of uh, attention, right? The attention yeah. or distraction mm -hmm. economy, right? Mm -hmm. This idea that I'm constantly being pulled, so I need to be able to understand what I'm, or, or I need to expect that users are doing nothing more than scanning. But I think there's also another angle to this lens, and maybe I can put you on the spot to think about this on the fly. But yeah, the other angle to this lens is like when I scan something, I should be able to kind of get a comprehensive picture of yeah. what it is without having to dig too much, right? It's not so yeah. much about distraction. It's being able to paint a complete picture yeah. of, of something in as few pixels, essentially, as possible. Does that resonate with you? Yeah, it does. It absolutely makes sense. And we talk a lot about that in my team. We often use words like hierarchy and prominence and just making sure things flow in a manner so that if someone does come to the page and we, we don't expect them to read everything, but we still want them to get a really good understanding of what's going on, it really needs to almost feel like we've designed the page or the screen so that your eyes follow it in a certain path. We want the user to follow it in a certain path and in a certain flow. Um, and I think it's not easy. It's, it's very hard to do when you've got a lot of content. Trying to build a clear hierarchy is really hard. Um, often what we try and do in my team is we try and chunk information together, whether that's using clear headings, perhaps cards. Cards have become quite a nice way to bring content together so that it brings focus because your eyes, eyes are drawn to that shape and then you kind of look at everything inside it. Um, and we often try and call on Miller's Law, you know, the magic number seven, which is often misinterpreted because people often have said to me, you can only have seven items in navigation. Well, it's not it's not seven items, it's actually short-term memory, you know, seven or eight chunks of information at a given time that you want people to store. So when we when we worked on the credit application process, for example, we were really trying to assess how we, do we have too many chunks of information? You know, we've got the first chunk, which explains what you need to do on this page. We've got the second chunk, which is asking for information. And I think that's, that's where you get into the thick of that process to really make it scannable. Um, I was just going to tell a little story because we were talking about New York before this yeah. started. And uh, I, I grew up in Manhattan and um, I think I learned this lesson um, 
on the streets of New York because my dad um, would approach tourists who appeared to be lost uh, and he would offer to help them. And of course, back in those days, there were no phones. People were looking, literally looking at a paper map where they were sort of huddled together looking around because they heard that New Yorkers were uh, aggressive uh, people. But my dad always wanted to help folks. Like he, that's just his instinct. Um, so he'd walk up to someone uh, and they would cringe, like they would be worried because here was a New Yorker um, ap- approaching uh, them. Uh, and they would ask for, eventually they would realize that you were asking for directions. And dad would always um, give them directions to wherever they were trying to go, but he would always give it in three steps. No more, no less. And he would ex- he explain to me when you're giving directions to someone, they can only remember three steps. So don't try and paint a whole picture. Just give them three steps. That's the yeah. those are the chunks Break that they down. can keep in their in their mind. Yeah. And here we are, forty years later, <laughs> still making <laughs> use of that of that wisdom. Yeah. yeah. Um, So now I'm going to ask you to kind of uh, be the mentor. Um, What it we talked earlier about kind of the the students that you've had a chance to interact Mm -hmm. with, the designers, that the young, the newer designers that you've had a chance to interact with uh, and how they don't um, they've not had that same opportunity to think as deeply about information architecture. I wonder if you could share with us um, uh, some advice or uh, some coaching that you might give one of those students uh, in how they can make use of, if if not scannability and just IA in general, but how might they make use of this lens in their own work? How would you coach them or advise them to do that? So a couple of things I would say. One thing in particular I would say is that I think it's important designers get into the habit of re- reviewing their own work. So don't just create the work, then look at it and say, does this work, does it not work? Because that's just part of the process. What I mean is really taking a step back from your work so you really detach from it. So that can mean taking time away from your work, maybe leaving it for the day and coming back to it the following day and looking at it with a fresh pair of eyes. I think when you when you do that process of self-reviewing your work, you can start to spot issues in the hierarchy. You can start to spot issues where, with there being too much content or, you know, we use too many words in this sentence. Can we say it in fewer words? Just your own fresh perspective, you know, a couple of hours a day, however long later, can can make that difference. And I think, to me, that is always uh, something that I fall back on to for designers that are not familiar with information architecture, because you're doing a little bit of information architecture when you're doing that assessment, when you're doing that reviewing, but you're not being thrown deep into information architecture, which I often find not all designers, but some designers find it a bit off-putting because they think it doesn't result in this great visual. So I think that's always a good starting point. You know, self-review your work, assess it from some of those key perspectives. You know, what is the most prominent element that you've got? Is is it supposed to be the most prominent element on your screen when it when the page loads for the first time? Think about the hierarchy. Really plan your hierarchy so that you're in control of it and it's not that there's multiple elements fighting for attention and it's like well some users might go down this way and some users might look at this first and this last you know plan it more carefully i think that uh that would be my primary kind of advice because i think that will get you into the thinking of you know information architecture um and into the that kind of you know that flow of questioning things from that perspective and not just focusing on on the visual Ron, that was great. I think we will leave it there. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me.